to be here today to tell you what uh, we do and what can be done to prevent and to screen for melanoma. And so, um, I guess I have to advance it. But sorry about that. So, melanoma incidents increase, uh, continues to rise. As we know, there is a true epidemic of melanoma in the United States, and not only melanoma is uh, increasing in incidence, but also more people die of melanoma, and that actually drives home a point that if we prevent melanoma, if we do something about melanoma early, maybe we can help stopping that epidemic. And uh, there are a number of uh, very high prominent uh, sun exposed uh, individuals who developed melanoma in the past who actually helped to bring it uh, to uh, us to, to make people aware of melanoma in the community. But uh, melanoma can affect all patients at all ages and uh, actually if you look at this pie chart you can see that melanoma and skin cancers represent majority of all cancers in the United States, more than lung cancer, more than colon cancer, more than breast cancer, the common cancers that you hear about. And this is because it's such a common threat, it's such a common uh, disease to, 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 to um, encounter. And uh, not only it is uh, costing lives, it al also costs uh, billions of dollars to take care of patients with skin cancers and with melanoma. And again, it drives home a point, maybe we can do something about it, maybe we can decrease that burden on our health system and on our patients' lives. And this is a graph that just demonstrates how rapidly incidence of melanoma increasing and how rapidly it is increasing in comparison to other cancers and actually to other preventative cancers. So there is something we're not quite doing right yet to get to the point when we can actually uh, stop that epidemic. So we, we will also focus on this group of patients. As you can see on this graph, this blue dotted light represents men with uh, melanoma and this purple line is women with melanoma. As you can see, there is a much higher incidence of melanoma in older men, and this is a population that was largely ignored, and now it really comes to light, and we are trying to focus our efforts on that specific patient population. So this slide is just uh, talks about uh, how important of a problem we are dealing with. This is a brochure that came out a few years ago, and it was uh, published uh, by the uh, uh, US government, the Surgeon General Call to Action to Prevent Skin Cancer outlined several goals. And some of them was increased sun protection in outdoor setting pro to educate individuals, to educate public what they can do about healthy choices about UV exposure, to promote policies that advance the national goal of preventing skin cancer, indoor tanning, to reduce harm from indoor tanning, and to strengthen research and to strengthen medical community when melanoma is detected, what we can do better. And so this is me, and this is Equator. So I am in Ecuador, one foot on the south hemisphere and one foot on the northern hemisphere. And I'm covered by a sunblock so I didn't even tan. You can see how white I am, and I'm always that color no matter where I go. And so uh, who gets melanoma? Melanoma risk factors. Uh, there are a few things that you probably know very well, people who have many moles, people who have uh, intermittent and very intense sun exposure like all of us. We are here in the winter. We are not really sun exposed, and then we go and during the summer we tan, or we go on vacations during the winter months to get more tan. And then, you know, we have fair phenotype, fair, fair, uh, fair skin, uh, blue eye, green eyes, uh, uh, red hair, family history of melanoma, personal history of melanoma, 
and uh, some other risk factors. But what can we do about these risk factors? Can we do anything about our skin color or about number of moles? Uh, really not, because uh, it's not something that uh, we can change. We, of course, can blame our parents for it, which is always works. But uh, I don't think it's going to get us too far. But the only uh, actually thing that we can do is to change the UV exposure and harms from UV rays to our skin. And so we'll focus on that um, in a moment. So melanoma prevention can be divided into primary, which is a behavioral change. It's a sun protection and uh, protection from other hazards. And that would lead to decrease in incidence of melanoma. And the secondary is a early intervention. So <laughs> if you're destined to have melanoma, then you will hopefully get decrease in mortality from melanoma. So who do I blame for uh, melanoma epidemics? I used to blame Coco Chanel. It's very convenient to blame her because in about uh, uh, 1920s or so, she came back from French Riviera wearing golden tan, and people realized, wow, it's so cool to have tan, and so that's where it all started. But actually, it probably coincided with a few other things. As you know, for centuries, uh, humanity was plagued with rickets. And uh, this is a disease that um, really is a problem with vitamin D deficiency. And uh, people realized that about 1920s that something, some substance in cod liver was really curing rickets. And later on, they realized the same thing happens if you have poor kids running around out on the sun as opposed to rich kids who stay at home and keep pale. They develop rickets, but not the poor kids, you know, not the fishermen children who are all day long exposed to the sun. And so around this time, really, a beneficial role of sun uh, came to light and, uh, you know, Tanning became such a in vogue thing to do. And so uh, bikini were invented uh, after the Second World War, and then the uh, tanning centers developed, started to develop in late 70s. And now we have more tanning salons than Starbucks. Um, and it's a true um, statistic. So this is something that uh, bear in mind how uh, terrible tanning is, and so we have so many tanning salons. And as Maureen has mentioned, we are really working very hard with New York State Department of Health to put a ban on tanning. Uh, uh, now there is a 17 and under, it's, tan uh, it's banned, but we're actually pushing for more restrictions, for restrictions on college campuses, and so on and so forth. But the, it, it is a huge industry thousands and thousands of tanning beds available. So is suntan ever healthy? So let's take a look at that. And uh, it's really not. It's really not an indicator of good health. And tanning is just like smoking. And I tell my patients, you don't smoke. Why do you tan? And even one sunburn can increase your risk of skin cancer. And there is no such thing as a healthy tan. Now, what about tanning beds? It's a true and real threat. There is an increased risk of uh, skin cancer coming from, mil uh, from tanning beds, from exposure at the tanning beds. And actually, there is a number, and I pu put some numbers in here, which is, again, it's an estimated statistics how many cases of skin cancer and melanoma are related to UV uh, exposure at the tanning beds each year. And um, tanning skin is damaged skin, and nearly one out of three teenage girls go and get tanning. So this is something to keep in mind again. But um, do I, uh, what, what is my message? Do I tell you not to go out on the sun? Absolutely not. So now let's talk a little bit about benefits of vitamin D, because this is what you get from sun exposure. 
There are two types of vitamin D, and I will talk about them in a second. But what I want to say is vitamin D is a wonderful vitamin because it's not only immunostimulating, it's against cancer. It's uh, necessary for health of your bones. It's necessary for health of your immune system. So it really is a good thing to have vitamin D on board. But you know what? You can never get enough vitamin D from outdoor exposure. You can get some vitamin D on sunlight, but what you need is probably five, 10 minutes a day, three times a week to your hands, legs, uh, face, and that probably will deliver enough dose of sun. If you expose yourself more, what you do, you actually destroy that vitamin D. And so people who keep tanning, they are not getting additional benefit from exposing themselves more to the sun. You need very, very little sun to get the benefit of uh, vitamin D. And we can talk some more, maybe if you have some questions afterwards. It's a very interesting subject. There are two types that you can buy over the counter. There is a vitamin D2, which is called ergocalciferol, and vitamin D3 that is called cholecalciferol. And this is the one that you are looking for. You need to buy vitamin D, and you need to take vitamin D. This is the natural one. This is the one that is more active than the other one. And so what else can we do? We can wear a sunblock. It's recommended that uh, you use SPF of 15 or higher, but I actually recommend SPF of 50 or higher. You have to go for the highest one. There is no benefit for you to use lower. And again, I don't have time to talk about sunblock. I have several actual lectures on sunblocks use. So we cannot do it in 15 or 20 minutes that I'm allocated for this, but I'm happy to talk to you about that but you need to have a very high SPF, especially if you have risk factors. You have to reapply every two hours. If you sweat or swim, you have to reapply every time after you're swimming. And you have to wear protective clothing, glasses, and so on. And you have to stay in shade. So the US Preventative Services Task Force recommendations came out this year, and I already had few patients coming to me misinterpreting this. That's why I put it in because I want you to have a clear a message and uh, uh, correct message that you need to carry um, on uh, to, to your loved ones, to, to your friends and family. And a um, number of people read that the, um, there is not enough evidence to recommend skin cancer screening. And so patients been coming to me and saying, well, why are we doing this skin, skin cancer screening? Because US uh, uh, task force just said, you know, there is not enough evidence. And so I want to dispel this myth. I want to tell you that it is not enough evidence. It doesn't mean that you don't have to do it. Because not enough evidence is just under, uh, underscores the need for more research. We just have to provide, and I hope I will provide you some evidence that may point in the right direction. But what it says is that all of us, we're all academic scientists. We apply, we apply to government to help us to get this research done. And it's very, very difficult to get this funded. So people like Samantha, who are uh, leading AMOT melanoma, they are providing funding to do this research. So we have enough evidence to do this. But more, moreover, I can tell you that people who are at risk, for them, the task force did recommend skin cancer screening. And so this is something that we do need to do for especially high-risk patient population. So this is something that is very important. And also, the, um, there, there are, as I mentioned, there are some studies that were done in Germany, for example, that uh, were treating um, patients who would come to primary care physicians and they would tell primary care physicians, you screen patients because it's not feasible for dermatologists to screen the entire population. Let's ask primary care physicians to help us. And 10 years later, guess what? These people who were screened by primary care physicians and in whom melanomas were found, they lived longer. So the life expectancy in melanoma uh, finally turned the corner. This is the first study that showed that in the prospective trial. But is it gonna work for us? 
So um, before I was recruited to come to uh, Columbia University, I was at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And there we had a very strong team um, devoted uh, uh, to melanoma, um, just like what we have here at Columbia. And so good things will come out here as, and coming out uh, uh, of Columbia as well. But this study was started about three and a half years ago, and that was sort of tailored after German experience. And so we had uh, two groups of primary care providers who, uh, one group we would tell, we will tell you how to tell melanoma or how to be worried about melanoma, and we ask you to do full body checks for your patients. And guess what? Three years later, what we find is that not only they uh, found more melanomas, uh, the primary care physicians, they referred appropriate patients to the dermatologist, but on average, the melanomas detected in this group were thinner than the melanomas that were detected in uh, the patient groups that were not screened by primary care physicians. So primary care physician is very important. It's a gatekeeper, but also it's a person who drives each individual patient's care. And what we found is that 5% of people in the screening group had uh, uh, thicker melanomas as opposed to 20% in pa patient group which was not screened by primary care physician. And so I think this is a message that um, finally maybe um, the task force will hear and will recommend normal uh, skin cancer screening for patients for all incomers. And so uh, we will definitely uh, recommend skin cancer examinations and we recommend sun protection for our patients. Now, um, I will quickly go through the slides for the sake of time uh, because I want to get to the um, screening of our patients and uh, quickly to uh, just show you what we do at Columbia University. We practice really state-of-the-art in melanoma screening. And um, screening is most effective when it's directed to high-risk patients, and so I will focus on that. So to find one melanoma, we truly need to do a lot of biopsies. And this is a pie chart that shows how many benign biopsies you need to do in order to get one melanoma. This is across the board. This is not in specialized clinics. So if you're going to the dermatologist who is not melanoma specialist, you have to expect, expect at least 20 biopsies, at least 20 biopsies to get one uh, melanoma. But if you look at the, oh, I just put it in here to say that this is the most common cause for patients to come to see me to tell them if this mole looks suspicious. So just to uh, remind me not to, to forget about that. Oh, I think I'm missing some slides, but, um, but it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to, uh, to the screening in a second. So um, this is something that I'm sure all of you know by now. It's ABCDs of melanoma. And the most important um, part in melanoma is actually this E, evolution or change. Because melanomas can be skin colored, melanomas can be symmetric, melanomas can present in all different ways. But if you have a skin spot that is changing, it may be a reason for consulting your doctor. And so evolution is something that I stress all the time. And of course, it's important to look at all the ABCDs of melanoma, but uh, evolution by far is the most important. And another thing how you can tell is by looking at ugly duckling, and there are many different scenarios. For example, in the first panel, the ugly duckling is the biggest and darkest, but on the second panel, it's actually the small and light one. So something that doesn't really fit with the um, pattern of, of your moles. And that's why I love doing mole checks because it's like doing that, you know, in childhood we had to find 15 differences between A and B. And so you will see how we do the mole checks and we truly look for differences. And so you find an ugly duckling, you find something that is different. Or you have one, only one, but something that doesn't really belong on your skin. 
So this is the slide that I wanted to show you with regards to screening and biopsies for melanoma that um, is a little out of order here. But what I wanted to say is that, you know, to do, uh, to find one melanoma, average dermatologist has to do a lot of biopsies. But it, it is different if you come to a specialist. And there are a number of studies that showed that specialists actually biopsy less, and they have much higher yield of melanomas that are detected at uh, their screenings. And this is just a graph to show that this is a, uh, pigmented lesion clinic. This is a high risk clinic that was diagnosing many more melanomas per uh, biopsy. And so it's something that is um, to keep in mind. Again, if you're a high risk uh, patient, you need something maybe more substantial than uh, just general screening. So how do we minimize the number of biopsies and how do we increase the yield for melanoma biopsies? And um, we're doing this by using melanoma imaging system called mole mapping. And basically, it's a several step procedure that many of my patients go through. And uh, it starts with us examining the patient and determining that they are high risk and they are, it's worthwhile for them to have the procedure done. They are being photographed in a special way, and I will show you the machine that we use. And these images are then processed by the computer, and the patient comes back to the uh, melanoma specialist to compare their skin against the documented <laughs> molds. And uh, the, uh, the way we uh, monitor is by using the state-of-the-art technology called mole mapping. And it is basically a full body map. It's like world map of your body where we document every little, tiny little spot, tiny little bump. The resolution is incredible. You can see every, every detail of the skin. And you can take uh, not only, uh, you, you not only can physically check against the map, you also can take consecutive images and the machine can tell you if there is anything new or changing. And this is basically several ways how we can take those photographs. And uh, when patients come, they are screened, uh, and then there is a machine that basically scans their body, we tell you how to hold your arms and how to turn, and so we can get really full body map. And then we uh, obtain this body scan. But in addition to that, not only we look at the full body scan, we also look for those the most atypical moles that normally the average dermatologist would just cut out. And you know, majority of those biopsies, as I showed you, are completely benign. They don't need to come off. But what we do, we use this instrument called dermoscopy so we can actually look under the skin. What is dermoscopy? Dermoscopy is using different wavelengths that allows us to look through the skin in the superficial layers of the skin, but something that we cannot see with the naked eye. And there are many different ways how we can do it in clinic. I never leave my house. I have my dermatoscope today with me. I never leave my house without it because everywhere I go, my only request is that people don't get undressed right there. They have to step, step out. Because everybody has something for me to look at, which is a good thing, and I'm never saying no to anyone because I think it's very important, and I did find few melanomas like that, because you know that something is wrong. You wouldn't bother me otherwise. So we have um, this machine that not only scans um, the, the body, but also has this device. This is an electronic uh, dermatoscope that actually allows for taking pictures on a much higher level. It looks like a little camera almost, and you, um, attach it to the skin, and you get images that you would not be able to distinguish with the naked eye. For example, this is image before, and this is image after using this dermatoscope. And you can see there is a tiny little tan patch that you would definitely miss with the naked eye, but you will never miss it with dermatoscope. And you can use a, a software called Mole Analyzer that can tell you the likelihood of this spot being a melanoma. But we don't really need to rely on that, and I can tell you why. This is a mole analyzer which can actually tell you the score. 
but again, this is not necessarily a diagnostic tool. This is just a kind of recommendation tool. This is something to guide you through. There are many different systems. I don't use them because I can show you why. Because um, this is from the company, Melafine Company uh, website, and every little dot on this graph represents a dermatologist who looked at the mole using um, uh, Melafine, using this uh, tool. And you can see dermatologists are all over the place how good they are. This is a sensitivity and specificity. It, it means that how good they are at recognizing melanoma. And you can see some of them are really not good at all. But there are three dots on, on the very, very top here, which actually are three melanoma specialists that were participating in a study. And we are way, way, way better than most dermatologists, not because we are smarter, not because we are better trained or anything like that. It's just because we are skilled at that because we're doing it day in, day out. And when you do something day in, day out for many, many years, you just get good at this. And so we are uh, kind of on the top of that uh, distribution. And you can see that with Melafine, some of them actually got as good as us. So Melafine was helping some doctors to diagnose melanoma. But again, uh, we don't need that for people who are trained. We are as good as Melafine or better. And there are a number of new technologies that are coming out. There is a uh, live uh, microimaging uh, and, and all kind of really cool things, confocal microscopy, that are the ways of the future. And it is something that will be available uh, in the future. Uh, one last slide, or one of the last slides, I want to say that I uh, want to warn you against using smartphones. Again, the study that came um, out of University of Pittsburgh on usage of smart smartphones, um, we're not there yet. They're not good, and they miss melanomas. And so they were tested against melanomas in the study, and they missed some. So if you have a question, call us, and we'll be happy to help you. So again, melanomas can come in many different shapes and sizes. You don't have to rely on ABCDs of melanoma all the time. If you have a question, ask your doctor. And uh, with that, I think uh, we are uh, very happy to tell you that we offer a free skin cancer screenings at the Department of Dermatology. I go around the city. I do free skin cancer screenings all the time, and I find melanoma all the time, everywhere I go. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, actually thank uh, Dr. Polan Moreau. Uh, Melissa was our most surgeon at uh, University of Pittsburgh, and uh, she was very active. She's a program director now at University of Pittsburgh, and uh, uh, she is a leader in melanoma screening. So she gave me this slide with a thankful patient who was willing to, to show how cool it is to be screened by a dermatologist. <laughs> and you see, um, we're all into it. So please um, don't, don't ignore and, and come, uh, and we'll be happy to see you. With that, I would like to thank again Maureen and everybody else uh, for coming on this Saturday, and uh, I'll take questions after the, after the talks. Thank you. <laughs>